very good morning all of you i welcome all my students for my session 4 which comes under the module 4 as far as the design of structural steel elements are concerned and this course is for the 6 semester students of vtu students i am dr m c nataraja professor from the department of civil engineering msrit bangalore students in the last class uh, as you know i was uh, discussing about uh, the behavior of laterally supported beam and also the behavior of laterally unsupported beam now as far as the laterally unsupported beams are concerns i was telling that the beam will undergo buckling in the lateral direction it is mainly because of the fact that iz of the section is substantially more compared to iy the moment of inertia with respect to the major axis of bending is very large compared to the value corresponding to the minor symmetric axis of the principal axis and also we have seen uh, many factors that influence the behavior of the laterally support laterally unsupported beam but as far as the laterally supported beam is concerned so the behavior is uh, very simple so the material undergo failure by yielding and the whole beam bends with respect to one particular plane and that is what the plane of the load in which we have the bending happening so now today let us see what are the various uh, provisions as far as is 800 2007 is concerned from the point of design of laterally supported beam students if you see the syllabus so the problems are also in the laterally supported uh, beam but laterally unsupported unsupported beam we need to study in greater detail but numerical problems are not there from the point of examination but however the design provisions for both categories of beam laterally supported as well as laterally unsupported i will be discussing in the today's class now let us see the design provisions as far as the laterally supported or the restrained beam is concerned and that if you have the plastic cross section or the compact cross section where we have the lateral support throughout the length of the beam the flexural strength of the section is mp so this is what i mentioned so there is a scope for the cross section to develop the plastified moment capacity and that is where the complete yielding of the cross section happens as you increase the load up to the failure so it means that uh, the moment carrying capacity of the beam is m and that can go up to md the design capacity and that design capacity is directly proportional to mp so mp is the full capacity but so this is what the design capacity so the design capacity you will be getting it after applying the appropriate partial safety factor m less than or equal to md is what the limit state equation as far as the limit state of collapse is concerned so this is what the situation provided uh, the web of the beam is uh, stocky means the web has to act as a short column where the depth of the web with respect to its thickness should be less than 67 epsilon and the epsilon as you know it is under the root of 250 upon the actual yield strength of the material but if you have a steel field stress 250 you can take epsilon as 1 for any other yield stress being the grade of steel we need to calculate epsilon can be less than 1 or more than 1 depending on the grade of steel considered where d is the depth of the beam in general but actually d by tw need to be calculated considering the actual prismatic thickness of the web so that's where uh, the depth over the fillet not depth over the flanges so leaving the fillet whatever the depth of the web you have where the thickness of the web is constant and that is what the depth need to be calculated and i'll be showing all these things uh, uh, when we discuss uh, some simple problems that is required from the point of uh, classification of the section as well so please remember 67 epsilon is what the condition that need to be satisfied and if this is what the situation so then there is no buckling of the elements happening it is not the lateral buckling 
buckling of the elements is not going to happen means the cross section is either plastic or compact the question of semi compact behavior where the distribution of the stress across the section is somewhat plastic and elastic is not going to be there but if you take a deep girder as you have in case of a plate girder usually d by tw is more than 67 and in that situation the design criteria will be slightly different and the cross section may not be able to develop emd so this is where uh, you should be careful for beams with plastic compact or semi compact flanges but slender web this is where d by tw greater than 67 epsilon comes into picture so obviously there is a problem of the web and that is where the susceptibility of the web for the shear buckling happens before the actual yielding the web is really not going to yield at all so this is what has been discussed in the earlier classes when there is no shear buckling means obviously it is the case uh, where buckling is not happening d by tw obviously is the 67 epsilon the nominal shear resistance vn equals plastic shear strength vp of the b in fact in the last class i told you what is this uh, plastic strength so that plastic strength has to be calculated based on the shear resistance of the section where the web is undergoing failure by shear yielding so that's what i have mentioned here the plastic shear resistance is given by the shear area the area of the cross section the area of the web resisting the shear multiplied by the yield stress what the yield stress that need to be considered in the design this is actually the octahedral shear stress so this is nothing but the yield stress in tension divided by root 3 so in fact the value of this yield stress is substantially less than fy and if you calculate that fy upon root 3 it is 0.578 times of fy it is approximately rounded off to 0.6 so 67 sorry 60 percent of the yield stress is what the stress that really causes the plastification of the web and uh, that is substantially less than fy so 0.6 of fy is the shear yield stress but otherwise fy is the yield stress corresponding to the axial tensile stress hence for the factor design shear force v less than 0.6 of vd where v is the actual shear force on the section where vd is the shear resistance from the point of design if this condition is satisfied the cross section is able to develop the full plastic moment and obviously we can go up to md the full moment capacity of the section from the point of design the entire cross sectional area is effective this is where we define uh, two cases of shear the low shear case so in fact v less than 0.6 of vd is referred to as the low shear case and v greater than 0.6 vd is high shear case which we will be discussing uh, later so if v as i mentioned greater than 0.6 of vd only the flanges will resist the moment it is a high shear case the moment capacity is less than md and it is referred to as mdv modified moment capacity which is the reduced moment capacity and we will see this uh, in the subsequent slides now as far as the present situation is concerned where uh, the cross section is subjected to the low shear where v is less than or equal to 0.6 of vd so what are the equations that really governs the behavior of the beam what exactly the design bending strength so kindly see the design bending strength the design bending strength is given by beta b zp fy upon gamma mo so this is uh, what you need to appreciate and in fact uh, if you recollect uh, in the plastic analysis we have used uh, these two terms zp multiplied by fy so this is where the plastic capacity of the section comes into picture the fully plastic uh, moment capacity plastified moment capacity and that is where the plastic hinge is going to come at that section but that need to be divided by gamma mo as far as the stress is concerned we are going to use the design stress fy is the characteristic strength fy upon the partial safety factor for the strength of the material if we consider then it is the design strength 
So design strength multiplied by ZP, the plastic section modulus, is what is referred to as the design plastic capacity of the laterally supported beam. The two when the shear is low. So that is where V is less than 0.6 of VD comes into picture. Of course, we need to use uh, one factor called as beta B and that beta B defines the type of the section. By chance, if the section is uh, plastic or even compact, beta B is equal to 1. By chance, if you have a semi-compact section, then that beta B will be less than 1 and uh, that we will be seeing in the next slide. So whatever the moment carrying capacity MD we have calculated uh, for the section, that also need to be checked for the two cases. When the section is used as a beam, which is simply supported, the formula is 1.2 ZEFY upon gamma MO. By chance, if the beam is a cantilever beam, then it is 1.5 ZEFY by gamma MO. So please see the formula from the plastic point of view and also see the formula uh, as far as uh, the elastic behavior of the section is concerned. So instead of ZP, here you have ZE. So ZE into FY, as I mentioned, it is the yield moment of the section. And that yield moment of the section is substantially less than the plastic moment, but we will be amplifying that by about 20% uh, so that the probable maximum moment carrying capacity under the working condition can be determined. So this is where uh, 1.2 where 0.2 if you see it is 20 percent it is something that can be compared to the shear factor the shear factor of uh, steel as you know it is 1.1 going up to 1.15 and uh, we rarely have sections where the shear factor can go beyond one point so that is where uh, the additional stress beyond the yield stress up to plastification it can be only 20 percent beyond yield stress so that's where 1.2 of ZEFY if it is a simply supported beam, otherwise it is 1.5 of the same ZEFY upon gamma MO. So why we need to check uh, the design moment MD though we calculate by the formula beta B ZPFY by gamma MO so that need to be that should be less than this particular value depending on the type of the beam. Why this particular condition need to be satisfied? So this is uh, only to ensure that the onset of plasticity is prevented under the unfactored load. So where the load is that is acting on the structure is uh, working, it is not factored. So based on the working condition, so try to identify the moment capacity and try to increase that by about 20% or 50% depending on the case and then see that that moment is always be more compared to the design moment of the section. So in fact, uh, so we need to uh, look some uh, good textbooks so that uh, the importance of many of these uh, uh, criteria and limitations will be able to appreciate. But in the examination, from the point of uh, attempting the question where your problem is going to be correct, we are simply expected to follow the course of practices. Whatever the equations that is there in course, you please simply refer, calculate the value of MD and simply check it that the value is less than or equal to 1.2 times of that formula if it is simply supported by and by chance if it is cantilever we have another formula to be checked so with this check uh, so we have identified the capacity of the beam from the point of design painting strength so this is what uh, the beta b equal to 1 for the plastic and compact section and uh, for the semi-compact section, it has to be less than 1. So that is where uh, it is ZE upon ZP. Now if you see this ratio ZE upon ZP, it is similar to the ratio ZP upon ZE, the shear factor which we have discussed in the plastic method of analysis. And uh, since uh, ZE is in the numerator, which is less compared to ZP, so obviously, so this factor is less than 1. By how much it is less? ZP by ZE is the shear factor and as you know the shear factor is 1.15 in an average and if that 1.15 if you take it to the numerator it is close to 0.87 so about 13% of reduction in the capacity of the beam comes into picture by chance if it is semi-compact in nature now these are all uh, some of the things uh, we need to remember 
from the point of cracking objective questions uh, in competitive examinations. So in fact, ZE upon ZP is the reciprocal of the shape factor. And if you take it to the numerator, so obviously it is 0.83 and 13% of reduction is what we'll be expecting. FY, as you know, it is the yield strength of the material. So it can be as low as uh, 220 megapascal and it can even go up to 540 to 560. So this is what the range at certain increment you have it and this information you get it from uh, IS 800 in many of the tables. Gamma MO is 1.1 so the material uh, safety factor and if you have a slender section so this is uh, the section where the extreme stress fiber stress is definitely less than the yield stress so obviously the moment carrying capacity is governed by the elastic moment capacity. So the elastic moment capacity means it is the elastic stress in the extreme fiber. It can be any value less than uh, Fy and we need to use the elastic section modulus. It is not the plastic section modulus. So these are all uh, some of the things uh, we need to look at from the point of analysis and design. Now, what I want to tell you at this uh, stage is any type of section can be used as a beam. If it is plastic and compact, we have a defined formula. By chance, if it is semi-compact, so we have some adjustment in the form of a beta where beta is less than one. And for slender section, so we don't have beta, but we are using elastic section modulus in terms of instead of plastic section modulus. And it is not the yield stress, it is the actual elastic stress at which we are calculating the moment of resistance of the section. Now let us see the other case if uh, V is greater than 0.6 of VD. So this is where the high shear case comes into picture. So these are all the situations uh, where the span of the beam is uh, not uh, that uh, long. So where uh, uh, the shear capacity, so near the end, maybe near the support or maybe at uh, uh, anywhere along the span where we have the concentrated effect of the load, uh, the shear strength is substantially more so where we will be applying more shear and that is where the high shear case comes into picture and in such situation substantial area of the web is already being utilized for resisting the shear so the web is really not contributing to the moment of resistance so in that situation the md what we calculate in the case of low shear that need to be reduced so this is where the plastic design moment which is uh, modified the modified design moment from the point of shear effect so that is where it is called as mdv that is equal to md where uh, the capacity is determined uh, where v is less than 0.6 of md we have a formula for that minus beta into md minus of mfd and of course the value what we calculate like this should be less than or equal to 1.2 times of the elastic section modulus into fy upon gamma m o. So what is this uh, uh, MFD? So MFD is the plastic design strength of the area of the cross section excluding the shear area. So obviously neglecting the area which is resisting the shear. So we need to calculate the moment carrying capacity of the section. So once you remove the web area, we have only two flanges. So in fact, uh, what is the moment carried by the flange alone? Of course, the moments carried by the flange alone is almost comparable to the moment carrying capacity of the section but many a times it is 80-85% or maybe 90% depending on the thickness and the depth of the web. So how to calculate this beta? So beta is uh, 2 times of V upon D minus of 1 whole thing square. So that is where uh, VD the design shear strength uh, by web building or the web buckling and factored applied shear force is referred to as V. So we know these two things and from this we will be able to calculate beta and substitute that value of beta in the formula and MFD also can be calculated because this is the moment carrying capacity of the flanges alone excluding the web area and therefore what is the modified shear capacity sorry modified moment capacity of the section in the presence of high value of shear in the web can be determined. 
So this is what uh, ZDA elastic section model of so the entire cross section. And by chance, uh, if the section is semi-compact and still we are dealing with uh, the I shear case, then MD is equal to elastic section modulus into yield stress by gamma MO. Friends, uh, this is uh, what the uh, provisions available in IS 800 from the point of analysis or even from the point of design of a laterally supported beam. Now let us see what is this laterally unsupported beam is. It is a laterally unrestrained beam. It is a laterally unsupported and laterally unrestrained. So both are one and the same. So these are the beams uh, where uh, the moment of inertia about the major axis uh, is somewhat uh, considerable and uh, it is susceptible to the lateral torsional buckling. And obviously this lateral torsional buckling is identified by one non-dimensional factor called as a non-dimensional slenderness ratio and that is lambda LT less than 0.4. You please simply remember as long as lambda LT given by some formula if it is less than 0.4 so then there is no lateral buckling happening. If it is by chance more than that then it is a case of laterally unsupported situation. So those uh, uh, beams which will not be undergoing uh, uh, lateral buckling so they are all called as uh, stocky beams and they develop a full MP but otherwise uh, the MP of the section decreases substantially. So in fact we are dealing with a situation where the moment carrying capacity of the beam is substantially less. So this is where uh, the determination of the critical stress at which, at which the susceptibility to the lateral torsional buckling happens. So this is where the elastic critical stress and its calculation and based on that what is the moment so that can be applied comes into picture. In fact we have seen uh, some of the formulas as a part of uh, laterally unsupported beam but we will be seeing uh, some more formulas which are available in IS 800 and that can be straight away considered from the point of analysis and design. Now this is uh, what the information I have uh, straight away taken from uh, IS 800. Now kindly see the strength of a laterally unsupported beam. It is given by MD. But what is this MD? So MD is, we have the same beta factor, ZP plastic section modulus. But instead of FY upon gamma MO, where FY upon gamma MO is slightly less than FY, but here we need to multiply that with FBD. ZP with that FBD, if we multiply, then we are going to get the bending strength of a laterally unsupported beam where FBD, the design bending strength in flexure is substantially less than FY upon gamma MO. FY upon gamma MO is the maximum value of the stress that can be permitted if there is no lateral buckling. Because here the compression flange undergo lateral buckling, the stress is substantially less than FY upon gamma MO and that stress is what is referred to as FBD and to determine that FBD, so we need to identify what is the slenderness ratio of the compression flange and accordingly what is the stress at which the lateral bending starts. So that is what need to be determined. So beta B is equal to 1 in plastic and compact and of course uh, so we have the ZE upon ZP in case of semi-compact and I have explained uh, the meaning of ZE and ZP and see if you want this FBD, that FBD is nothing but FY upon gamma MO. FY upon gamma MO is what the maximum value that is permitted in the laterally supported case. Since it is laterally unsupported case, that value will be multiplied by this factor, Xi LT. So obviously, this Xi LT will be less than 1. So thereby, we will be able to decrease this stress. So the objective of this is to see that the stress that can be allowed is always be less less than FY upon gamma MO and what that value so that is where uh, the use of ZLT comes into picture. So gamma MO is 1.1 being the partial safety factor for the material strength and ZLT it is the bending stress reduction factor to account for buckling. So this is a reduction factor because you kindly see this this is the reduction factor and that is 1 upon so we have a formula where phi LT plus phi LT square minus of lambda LT square the entire thing under the root and if you take it outside it is to the power 0.5 
and that should be less than or equal to 1. So this is where uh, the bending stress reduction factor less than 1 comes into picture. If you recollect uh, the design of uh, compression members, a similar type of uh, formula, you must have seen it. So there also exactly the same type of formula comes into picture. There the column as a whole undergo buckling in the lateral direction. We will be dealing with the column buckling over the entire height of the column. But here we are dealing with the buckling of the compression part of the beam. So that is where uh, the web buckling over the span of the beam comes into picture, which is the partial buckling of the cross section. Whereas in column, it is the complete cross, cross sectional buckling over the height of the column. And if you see this uh, phi LT, again it is given by a, a formula 0.5 bracket, open out the bracket 1 plus alpha LT, again bracket. So this lambda LT minus of 0 0.2 plus lambda LT whole square. So there is no other go except to remember uh, some of these formula. Not to remember the formula because uh, the code will be given in the examination. So you have to know where exactly these formulas are available and what exactly the formula also need to be known because at the time of copying the formula also you may commit certain mistakes. So that is where certain awareness about the importance of the formula, the flow and how exactly the calculation also go from one step to another step is also needed to be looked at. Now kindly see, so there is a lambda LT coming into picture. Ultimately, it is lambda LT that controls the behavior. So that is where uh, the span of the compression flange and how the compression flange is connected to the uh, adjoining members, whether by bolting or by welding. And what is the effectiveness from the point of rigidity of the joint? So thereby, the effective span of the compression flange also comes into picture. And in fact, uh, so we have tables available in IS 800. So that will give you the information about how to calculate lambda LT. So phi LT is the imperfection factor. In fact, the imperfection factor here is only 2.21 for the rolled value, rolled section, and 0.49 for the welded cross section, the fabricated cross section. But in case of uh, column design, we have four values of imperfection factors. That is where A, B, C, D, E imperfection factors comes into picture. But here it is only two. One for load section, which is lesser, and for welded section, which is almost uh, double. That is where 0.49 comes into picture. Now, what is this uh, lambda LT? I mentioned that as slenderness ratio, but here it is called as non-dimensional slenderness ratio because you are going to get some value that value is not having any unit and uh, that is equal to under the root of beta b zp fy divided by mcr where mcr is the elastic critical moment it is a moment at which uh, the onset of the bending in the lateral direction just starts so obviously it has a value it means uh, when you apply the load on the beam the beam will undergo conventional bending the lateral buckling will not be there initially only after certain amount of load is applied. So where the moment exceeds this critical moment, so we have this uh, phenomenon of lateral buckling uh, creeping in. And that should be less than under the root of 1.0 CDE FY upon MCR. And that can also be equal to, so we have a formula, yield stress upon FCRB. So what is this FCR? It is again the elastic critical stress, similar to the stress being defined in uh, column buckling in compression member. So there it is a column, but here it is the beam in bending. We also have a formula. In fact, uh, this formula I showed in uh, the previous uh, uh, presentation in the previous class. So this is uh, MCR and that is equal to under the root of. In fact, I also explained as to what are all the various factors uh, so that will have an influence. So you see IY, the resistance with respect to the weak axis comes into picture and we also have this uh, G. So this is where uh, the polar, so this is where uh, the shear modulus. So shear modulus is a function of elastic modulus and also you see here you have the IT. So this is where uh, the torsional moment of inertia also comes into picture. So this is where the polar moment of inertia equal to the summation of uh, the rectangular moments of inertia comes into picture. So IZ plus IY is equal to IT. And also we have the warping effect. So called as the warping inertia. 
so if you take all these things into consideration so that can be uh, written in this fashion as a function of the elastic critical stress into plastic section modulus and of course uh, that beta factor depending on the type of the cross section also comes into picture so how to calculate uh, the it so this is uh, where uh, the constant comes into picture so it constant uh, is uh, kindly say here it is given by sine to announce uh, constant and we have formula so using all these uh, formula systematically step by step uh, so we should be able to calculate the elastic critical moment and from that uh, we'll be able to calculate the allowable bending stress and sometimes the calculation of uh, the stress from the fundamental approach is always very difficult so what i suggest students is to write a simple computer program for these things and see how best the problem can be tackled maybe a small mini project and sometime as a part of the major project also many of these things can be tackled where some research data available in the technical papers can also be considered and some extended type of studies uh, is also possible as a part of your projects and those students who are interested in uh, structural analysis and design especially from the point of uh, steel so they can take some projects of this type and again uh, so we have uh, another uh, formula so this formula is uh, applicable only for the symmetric uh, i section and uh, that section can also be welded also or it can be even a conventional i section so it is very similar to the previous formula but what is important is uh, the factors that are very important from the point of behavior comes into picture so that is where iy hf lt the radii of aggression with respect to the weak axis and of course hf upon uh, thickness of the flange so what is uh, of all these things is also being uh, explained so you can just uh, go through these things uh, systematically one by one and finally the mcr can be calculated and if you cannot calculate mcr you can also calculate uh, fc or b so either you can calculate mcr and as a function of mcr we can calculate uh, the allowable bending stress otherwise the elastic critical stress also can be calculated and using this elastic critical stress also allowable bending stress can be calculated so let us go back to those formula kindly see here so this is where uh, the bending stress is allowable bending stress and this allowable bending stress is a function of uh, zlt so finally this is uh, the approach with which you will be able to calculate uh, md straight away otherwise so you can calculate uh, mcr from mcr will be able to calculate uh, the allowable stress otherwise from the consideration of the critical stress in bending also we will be able to calculate the allowable bending stress so this is uh, what the procedure that is available in uh, is 800 and follow the procedure meticulously and try to solve one problem from the point of understanding so though it is not uh, required from the point of examination especially for uh, the meritorious students uh, it is always be interesting to see that one or two problems are solved in this direction now let us see the types of uh, buckling in uh, beam and uh, the buckling of the compression flange can happen in different uh, ways and means it all depends on uh, what is the effective depth of the web so and that effective depth again depends on the restraints that is there with respect to the top flange how that top flange is able to undergo movement in the lateral direction is it that the flange can undergo only deflection in the lateral direction or is that it can only undergo rotation or is that combination of the lateral deflection and rotation both exist so depending on the situation the nature of the buckling is different and based on that uh, it's always be possible to identify so what is the manner in which the behavior is taking place and with that we'll be able to analyze the performance of the beam now kindly see these uh, four conditions so where the beam is uh, restrained against the lateral deflection and the rotation where deflection is not possible rotation is not possible but it is buckling then there is only one way of buckling that buckling happens in the vertical direction the flange is not getting displaced 
but web buckles if this is what the situation then the effective depth of the web from the point of design so this is required uh, especially to define the column buckling so that depth is taken as d1 by 2 so what is d1 by 2 we'll be able to see in the next slide where i have shown with the help of figure the second case is that it is restrained against the lateral deflection where it is not able to move laterally but it can undergo rotation in its position so that is where the second situation so in that case it is two third of d1 kindly see what is happening to the value it is d1 by 2 it is 0.5 off it is two third of d1 so this is where it is more than off but less than one it is where 0.66 comes into picture so kindly see the type of restraint here it is restrained against the rotation it is not restrained as far as lateral deflection is concerned so it can deflect laterally but it cannot undergo rotation so in that case it is d 0.5 0 0.66 and now it is one times of d1 not at all restrained not restrained against rotation and also lateral deflection so the effective depth is 2d1 so here it can undergo lateral movement and at the same time it can undergo rotation in its final position so where the deflection in the lateral direction the buckling effect in the lateral direction is quite substantial and as a result of that the effective length is uh, definitely 2d1 which is onto the higher side if the depth becomes larger and larger the slenderness ratio of the web also becomes larger and as a result of that the web tends to behave as if it is a long column so more and more of slenderness uh, behavior and the effect to stress will be lesser and lesser so whatever uh, i mentioned uh, just now so the same thing is uh, being shown with the help of uh, uh, sketches so this is the pictorial representation now kindly see what the first case is so here the cross section is getting compressed so there is a small vertical deflection of the cross section what you can say but the position of the flange is intact so there is no lateral movement now there is any rotation so that is where delta l is zero theta is zero but still it buckles in the vertical direction vertical buckling of the column where the flange is not having any lateral displacement nor the rotation see the second case the lateral deflection is zero but rotation is possible and that rotation will be able to see but here you see the flange is horizontal but here the flange is not horizontal if you extend this uh, top flange so there is theta coming into picture only theta exists that's what i have put it here as a question mark what is theta find out but the third situation is uh, such that there is no lateral displacement so sorry so there is a lateral displacement that you can see here kindly see the vertical line what i have shown here is starting from the edge of the bottom flange but if you extend it so it is not touching at the top but otherwise in the first case it is touching in the second case also it is touching indicating that laterally no movement but there is only angular movement as per the second case is concerned but in the third case kindly see here there is a lateral movement happening to the left side but there is no theta the flange is horizontal and it is intact but if you see the fourth one so that is where more criticality comes into pictures the web is buckling in such a way that the flange is also getting distorted so that is where the torsional effect comes into picture so there is theta if you extend the top flange so definitely there is an angle theta and also if you see at the edge so there is a small lateral displacement so what is the delta l but if you see at the bottom so the line is in contact but otherwise so you can notice that there is a small departure as per the position of the top flange is concerned that is where the movement in the lateral direction the linear movement and also you have angular movement as far as the case 4 is concerned so this is uh, what the diagram i have uh, borrowed from uh, sk dugal textbook the limit state design of steel structure now in fact uh, so this is uh, the concept of vertical buckling of the web is also called as column buckling so this has been discussed in the previous class where i have shown the figure and explained the concept so it is because of the slenderness effect of the web 
uh, we have <coughs> this particular problem and now we need to define a formula so there also I have defined one formula as to what is the slenderness ratio of the web the slenderness ratio of the web can be calculated by considering uh, the web portion near the center where the buckling is assumed to be maximum but if you see in all the previous cases the web near the center is departing substantially away indicating that the maximum buckling effect is somewhere near the mid depth of the beam so that is the reason i have taken the mid depth and this is what the stiff bearing width and at the stiff bearing width if you draw a line at an angle of 45 degree and see what is the cross-sectional area that is available in the web so that is the portion that really gets pushed in the uh, lateral lateral direction and uh, this particular area is what is to be considered in the calculation of uh, the slenderness ratio of the web and that is where b tau so that is where b1 comes into picture so b1 is nothing but the stiff bearing width and of course some extra width so what is that extra width is nothing but the of the depth of the beam because the angle is 45 degree so you will be able to calculate what is b1 and that b1 multiplied by the thickness so what i have shown here in color it is the cross section when you cut it along this uh, b1 so you will be able to see the web area and that is where the thickness of the web also comes into picture so thickness of the web into the length at the center so which is the dispersion effect uh, at an angle of 45 degree going up to the mid depth so the area of the web can be determined so this is what is referred to as the single dispersion but if you have a concentrated load anywhere on the span so this is what the load on the plate so the bearing width is known but at this tip so if you take a 45 degree line and similarly from the other tip if you take 45 degree line so you have the b so in this particular case uh, the b is substantially more because of both the sides of the plate coming into picture and uh, here there is only one side of the plate coming into picture and that is where the dispersion to one side because the disp dispersion to other side is really not possible because on the other side there is no beam even the extension of the beam is also not available so with this uh, we will be able to calculate the stress that really causes the buckling so with reference to that stress and multiplying with the area what is the allowable load the web can carry and as long as the reaction is less than that as long as the applied load is less than that uh, so the beam is safe otherwise the column buckling really happens now this is where uh, the derivation uh, comes into picture what is this derivation now kindly say here so for the derivation uh, so what is important is to look at uh, this depth d1 the overall depth of the i section is uh, capital d so we need to identify what is d1 which is the depth over the fillet so this is what the fillet uh, as you can see here so leaving this fillet we need to calculate and what is the root of the fillet you will be able to get it from the steel table so thickness of the flange also you know it so what is the depth so that is h1 so that can also be calculated uh, from steel table so finally so this uh, d1 is uh, known now when you have a enormous uh, shear force acting here so near the center we know the shear stress at a point the shear stress at a point is something like this and uh, if you see the resultant of the shear and if you take these two shear and these two shear so the resultant is uh, something like this it is a diagonal tension but we need to see the resultant of the shear as far as this two shear is concerned it is going like this and as far as this two shear is concerned it is going like this it is a sort of compressive effect so because of this uh, uh, compression effect the portion of the web near the support uh, where you have the concentrated load undergo buckling and that is in the form of a wave buckling wave so over this entire length uh, you see the diagonal buckling so this is the diagonal buckling but if you take one particular strip in the zone of diagonal buckling where the width of the buckled part is taken as unity and how this element is undergoing buckling this is something like bending like a beam and that is where with respect to the cross section so the distribution of the stress comes into picture so that is what uh, the idealization i have done it here so taking b equal to one and if you cut it here you have the web 
and the thickness of the web is TW but for the unit width so how the stress is distributed with respect to the neutral axis so this is what uh, the axis is and this is what the thickness and we know the moment of inertia of uh, this cross section of unit width so it is BD cube by 12 where B is equal to 1 D is the thickness so 1 into T cube by 12 is what the moment of inertia and of course we need the radii of gyration with respect to the weak axis as far as this uh, buckled element is concerned so this is the major axis and this is what the weak axis the area is uh, known so 1 into tw is what the area i is known under the root of i by a is what r is with respect to the weak axis so if you calculate that so that will give you the minimum radii of gyration and that minimum radii of gyration is thickness of the web upon root 12 so this is nothing but bd cube by 12 divided by area under the root where b is equal to 1 but d is the thickness so with that we will be able to derive this formula and the effective length uh, as you can see here it is d root 2 by 2 and that is equal to d1 by root 2 and that is also equal to 0 0.707 so in fact uh, the effective length of 0 0.707 also I explained uh, in the previous class uh, and this is done by considering the web as a column where it is uh, connected between the two flanges so since the two flanges acts as a, a sort of uh, uh, fixity to the web so web is treated as a fixed beam so with that fixed beam concept over the depth of d1 so it is 0 0.707 d1 is the effective length now the slenderness ratio is nothing but uh, uh, this one so the effective length divided by the minimum radii of variation and if you simplify that so we have this formula and further it boils down to 2.45 d1 by tw what is d1 by tw so it is nothing but uh, the ratio of the depth to the thickness ratio of depth to the thickness uh, is definitely some value greater than 1 and that also need to be multiplied with 2.45 so you get this slenderness ratio as some number something like 60 70 80 90 and based on that value we need to calculate what is the stress column buckling stress from the annex connected with the column design in IS 800 and in fact we also have uh, tables uh, where depending on the grade of the steel and also depending on the uh, buckling nature so you will be able to calculate uh, the allowable buckling stress as far as the web behavior is concerned so taking that stress into consideration and multiplying that uh, with the area which is contributing to the buckling near the center near the mid depth uh, we will be able to calculate the allowable load that causes the buckling depending on whether it is a single dispersion case as you have in case of a support or it can be a concentrated load anywhere along the span of the beam so friends uh, we have uh, another uh, concept the web crippling and this is also being referred to as the crimpling so the web crimpling happens uh, near the junction of the uh, flange and the web and kindly see the junction so we have a fillet and away from the fillet where the radii of the fillet is ending and if you draw a line horizontally so we have the depth of the root of the fillet and of course you also have the depth of the flange so sorry depth of the flange means yes it is the thickness of the flange plus the radius of the root fillet with that we will be able to calculate this height so this is referred to as uh, uh, h2 in your uh, steel table and of course uh, this uh, d1 is referred to as h1 what is this d1 it is uh, nothing but uh, the prismatic uh, thickness over the depth of the beam so wherever the thickness is uh, constant and if you identify the height of that so that is what the web uh, which is susceptible to the crippling but the crippling really happens at the junction which i have uh, explained in the previous class because of the concentration of the stress resulting from the concentrated load and if there were to be no bearing plate the concentration of the stress would have been very high and too much of a crippling or a crimpling will be able to see to reduce that so you will be providing the bearing plate 
and in many cases of uh, conventional beam design so this web crippling nor the crimpling is not going to happen so only in case of uh, deep sections in case of girders so where d1 is substantially higher which i explained in the uh, first uh, uh, few classes uh, that uh, we have a sudden buckling phenomena in the web also where shear buckling comes into picture and in such situations of plate girders uh, and deep girders so we have uh, the too much of a concentration of stress and failure happening so that is where uh, the crippling becomes very very critical but in this particular case of conventional beam so this may not be that critical but we need to satisfy and in case we have some problem of this type how to avoid is also the question to be looked at we need to provide some stiffener whether it is a web buckling or a crimpling we need to provide some plate or some angle supporting the web so thereby the thickness of the web is increased so we can put simply a plate on either side of the web or you can also put an angle where angle is also supporting the outstand and these type of situations uh, will be able to appreciate in many of the advanced designs uh, when you go to the higher semesters so we need to provide additional stiffness plate stiffness web stiffness over the entire height of the web or only over certain height on just one side or even onto both the sides can also be provided and these are all the ways and means with which uh, the web buckling being the column buckling or even the web crimpling because of the stress concentration effect at the junction can be totally avoided so this is uh, what the concept so from the end of the bearing plate so we need to take a slope of 1 is to 2.5 and with that what is the length of the web at the junction which is contributing to this stress so that is where b1 is equal to b plus n1 comes into picture so this uh, b is nothing but the stiff bearing width in case of problems uh, we need to assume this value as uh, 100 mm 10 centimeter 12 centimeter 15 centimeter depending on the situation unless otherwise specified i request the students to take b as just 100 mm and with that 100 mm what is this n1 so kindly see this n1 is the horizontal length beyond the edge of the bearing plate but what is the depth at that location the depth is nothing but thickness of the flange plus the root value radius of the root so that is where h2 comes into picture so knowing that h2 being equal to one time what is horizontally going by 2.5 times so that is what the extra length beyond the stiff bearing width so that the total bearing width can be calculated and if that width multiplied by the thickness being the area at this section so we will be able to get the concentrated stress uh, which is really responsible for the crippling crippling means it is uh, out of plane of deformation in the form of a yielding that is happening near the junction where the stress is really really beyond its stress so what the stress you calculate uh, based on this area uh, taking this reaction into consideration for one single uh, dispersion uh, effect and if that stress is within the yield stress there is no crimpling by chance if it is exceeding the yield stress of the material definitely the crippling will happen and the load carrying capacity decreases and the beam will not be able to carry that reaction so in such situation we need to design additional bearing plates as far as the web is concerned otherwise we may have to go to the higher section where the thickness of the web is more so instead of going for the higher section and making the beam uneconomical because the problem is only at the end so this can be addressed indirectly as if it is a local problem where you can increase the web thickness by putting some plate over certain length it is something like uh, some plate over certain depth of the web and certain width of the web and in the form of a square plate or a rectangle or plate if you put it near the support maybe onto one side or maybe onto both the side depending on the situation so you will be able to avoid the crippling for crippling problem if at all there is uh, any severity of this uh, situation but when you have a double dispersion situation as you have uh, in case of a uh, concentrated load on the span so we need to calculate uh, the additional value of n1 so we have seen one n1 onto one side and we have a similar value of uh, n1 onto the other side because the dispersion is symmetric so beyond b so it is 
plus 2n. So b plus 2n is what the width, stiff bearing width, considering the dispersion effect and that multiplied by the thickness and that is what the area and uh, the load divided by that area if we calculate the stress and that stress should be less than the yield stress of the material from the point of safety. And once we take up some design problems, my dear friends, you will be able to understand and appreciate the concept. So the last thing is uh, the built up beam or the compound beams. So this is what the beam with cover plates. I will simply introduce to the concept here. And sometimes instead of selecting a heavy section for a given ZP, because in case of a laterally supported beam or in case of an unsupported beam, we need to select the section for ZP. Then it becomes a single section and sometimes uh, such type of heavy sections may not be available and also from the consideration of economy sometimes we will be decreasing the depth of the eye section because if we increase the depth of the eye section we have many lateral effects coming into picture so obviously that can be addressed by decreasing the depth of the eye section but that is not the sufficient section so thereby so we go for a smaller eye section decreasing the secondary effects and totally avoiding the secondary effects and we will be providing additional plates at top and bottom so that the required moment of inertia and hence the required section modulus with respect to ZZ can be addressed. So what we normally do is we provide additional plate which is either uh, equal to the width of the flange or less than the width of the flange and as you have seen in this case it is a riveted or a bolted situation where the plate at top and bottom is uh, connected. So bolted connection or the riveted connection, I will discuss one problem in this particular direction. And also you can have a situation where uh, the width of the plate can be smaller and it can be larger on the other side also depending on the situation. It can be symmetric also, it can be less or more than the width of the web, I'm sorry, width of the flange depending on the situation. So what is important in the design is uh, to select an eye section for a lesser Z uh, where uh, 40, 50, 60 percent of uh, the original Z need to be considered and the section is to be selected and for the remaining percentage of the Z so we can put uh, two steel plates and check that the two plates of some width and thickness is really giving that additional uh, plastic section modulus. So this is where uh, the plastic section modulus of the eye section and the plastic section modulus of uh, the two extra plates comes into picture both put together if the section modulus is more than the required modulus or even the moment of inertia if it is more than the required one then the design is safe but here we have to always go by plastic section modulus and the selection of the eye section is also by plastic section modulus and the two additional plates also need to be designed as far as its area is concerned from the point of the additional section modulus required. So this is where uh, a simple equation uh, from the point of design of the cover plate comes into picture and the required plastic moment of inertia is IP or EQ but we will be selecting a smaller I section for which it is IZZ and additional moment of inertia to be offered by the plate is uh, IA and what is the IA? So IA is nothing but so this is the required value minus what is the i for which you have already selected this section so this is what uh, the equation is if you divide this by of the depth of the cross section throughout so we have an equation something like this so this is nothing but the moment of inertia divided by the distance of the extreme fiber and that is where the section modulus with respect to the plate comes into picture of course this is approximate and similarly this is the section modulus of the uh, re total required uh, uh, section from the point of full plastification and this is uh, what the plastic section modulus of the plate. So finally, so you are able to get uh, what is this uh, ZA. So ZA is nothing but uh, the area of the plate into the distance of the centroidal axis of the two plates. So that is uh, nothing but the area of the plate is uh, ZA upon H but you know area is uh, BF into TF. So for a given BF, what is TF that can be identified or so if you know the thickness, the BF also can be identified. So what is important uh, in a built up beam design is to select some section for 
lesser moment of inertia or the less lesser section modulus approximately 40 to 50 percent of the required plastic uh, section modulus and the remaining section modulus need to be met with uh, two plates one at top and one at bottom so what is that required section modulus is already being defined and that if you express in terms of an area and finally we will be having something like this so we need to calculate what is za and if that za is equal to area of the plate into h h is already known because we have already selected the section and a a is known and from that a a we can calculate the bf and thickness so with one simple example so you'll be able to understand and appreciate uh, all these concepts friends i have come to the end of uh, the provisions all the equations that are there in IS 800 I have explored and uh, you must also must have uh, appreciated the importance of all these things. So when you have IS 800 in front of you, so any problem on beam, simply supported beam, fixed beam, continuous beam, all types of beams can be uh, attempted. But in examination, we will be having uh, simple problems and few of these simple problems I will be discussing in the next class. Thank you very much my dear friends, so we will continue in the next class.